And Chennai is also special. And uh, uh, our prophet is coming out from his break, his 40 day break. And uh, so tonight, uh, after the uh, after the after this message, uh, I'll share a very brief message, and then after that, I'll let you take a break. And uh, then uh, after your break, then uh, uh, we come back and we might sing one or two songs to get us into the atmosphere again. And uh, then uh, our, our David will share what was in his heart and then he'll be free to uh, move uh, and prophesy uh, to each one of us as the Lord leads him and uh, those of you who want to be prophesied over uh, you can be at the two sites uh, afterward we give more instructions uh, and, um, and those of you who, who you know that uh, you say no you, you're not looking for prophecy it's okay you can remain where you are and you can continue praying and why we want to do that is uh, immediately after the prophecy uh, we like each one to go back and uh, just soak into the prophecy and continue in prayer don't take a break until you pray through or you, you just uh, soak in anointing and uh, just continue in the presence of God which is why we take a break before the prophecy time and uh, not after and so we're going to do it slightly differently tonight and then flow with however the Holy Spirit leads uh, the rest of the night and uh, we're going to touch on a new series on humility and uh, then uh, that will prepare us also for tonight all that God wants to do in uh, the Bible exhorts us to be humble and in the book of uh, First Peter let's look at the book of First Peter and fasting 40 days is also a way of humbling ourselves before God and we want to especially cap tonight as the 40 days uh, realizing uh, that we humble ourselves before God and we can expect uh, God to uh, release all that He wants to release into our lives the scripture we are reading is uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 James also says the same thing but uh, we read, most likely we read both passages 1 Peter chapter 5 and we are looking at verse 5 Onwards, likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God receives the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. That's one passage on humility. Uh, the other passage to read is in the uh, book of James which is just before the book of 1st Peter and it's taken from James chapter 4 <coughs> verse 5 and uh, 6 and 7 or do you think that the scripture says in vain the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously but he gives more grace therefore he says God receives the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Tells us again that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. One more passage in the book of uh, tonight we want to tie to our 40 days uh, fast so I like to also read Philippians chapter 2 Philippians chapter 2 and talking about our Lord Jesus Christ himself starting from verse 5 onwards Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 and especially it tells us to be humble to be like-minded and uh, to have what you call in verse 3 lowliness of mind so it says here in verse 5 let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in a form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man 
He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And then the rest we know. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, and that is a wonderful verse talking about our Lordship, uh, uh, the Lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ. But everything is preceded by humility. We see Jesus humble himself and came and make himself of no reputation in verse 7. Reputation is such an important thing to humans. Jesus made himself of no reputation. Uh, I want to talk about Jesus humbling himself. Uh, we cannot exhaust him because there's so many uh, a thousand and one ways and more in which Jesus has humbled himself. And we talk about Jesus humbling himself. Firstly, we realize that even for Jesus, who is the second person of the Godhead, he was not known as Jesus before he came. He was known as the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The name Jesus was only taken when the Word became flesh. But before that, there was God the Father, God the Word, and God the Spirit. And for Him to come down here, to put Himself lower than the angels, when He is part of the Trinity, He is the Trinity, he is the manifestation of the Trinity. So we see the first act of Jesus' humility, the greatest humility that He demonstrated, and He must have all, all the angels and the spirit beings. Never before, in any age, never before since the creation, of the world and of angels and spirit beings and the beginning of all life in the universe has that ever occurred. It was an awesome moment when Jesus emptied himself. The word emptied himself and came all the way to become a lowly human being. Born into a vessel of clay part of the human race but perfect and of all things to start life as a little baby a little human starting from the womb and then being born as a human learning the language of humans that is something we cannot comprehend while on this earth but that was the first act of Jesus humbling himself now, if he could do that much, what is us humbling ourselves? Nothing. And then after that, he humbled himself when he grew up under Joseph and Mary. He humbled himself when he went to John the Baptist, who was a ministry before him. And Finally, he came into his own and he was the Messiah. He chose all his disciples, taught them for three years. By the end of the three years, just before he was to be crucified, he humbled himself like a servant and washed his disciples' feet. And then he gave his life on the cross. He finally got exalted. His whole life was a life Choosing to humble himself. Most people get humbled by circumstances. Most people get humbled by others. Most people get humbled as, uh, as they face situations beyond their control. But that's not true humility. True humility is when you have a choice to be proud and you choose to be humble. If you have a choice to be mighty and you choose to be small. If you have a choice to be powerful and you choose to be powerless. There's a free choice in walk in humility. All the other types of humbling 
that you see happens to humans, like Nebuchadnezzar being humble, and many proud people in the Bible being humble, that's not counted. That's not humility. That's just the second part of the verse on humility that we write in 1 Peter 5 and James 4, where it says God resists the proud. That was not humility. That is God resisting the proud. The interesting thing is, in both ways, humility needs to come. See, when the proud get humble, say you're humble, and then if you choose to humble yourself, you also get humble. On both counts, you get humble. Humility is good. Humility is important. If we don't humble ourselves, someone, something, some situation, or if not, God Himself will humble you. He resists. That's the one time when the Bible talks about God being very active. Because through His angels, He resists. Say, are there any Bible situations? There is Nebuchadnezzar, but there's one in the New Testament. Remember, Herod. Herod became proud. I mean, he was already proud. But he got even more proud. Because he killed an apostle. And he imprisoned another one. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts, in chapter 12, verse 2, he killed James, the brother of John. And don't forget, the church has already grown very big. They had signs and wonders. And so imagine, here he was, Herod, and he gave the command to kill one of the twelve apostles. And after that, when he saw that the Jews were very happy, he proceeded further. He's been encouraging his pride. He proceeded further and he got the head of the representative head of the church at that time, Peter. Jesus, they know, is the head. But the human representative at that time, Peter, was in charge. He arrested the head, seized him and locked him up. And of course, an angel released him. And uh, But he was still very proud. In chapter 12, when he interviewed how Peter escaped in verse 19, when Peter had searched for him and not found him, examined the guards, and when the guards said, We don't should know. Because it was supernatural. All some the spirit of God must have kind of put all the guards to sleep. And the angel came and Peter just walked out of prison. When he interviewed the guards, the guards probably said, we slept, we woke, he was gone. Herod said, Off with their head! And he sentenced them to die. What a man. And then verse 20. Herod had been very angry at the people of Tyre and Sidon. They came to him with one accord. And uh, on that day, they made peace. And Herod was proud. Proud Herod! Verse 23, on a Sunday, he arrayed in his royal apparel. And you know how early kings, sometimes they look so royal, and with all their royal protocol, and, uh, and it's a grandeur, we human, you know, uh, mawe grandeur. And that was Herod arrayed in all his grandeur, his royal apparel. He sat on the throne. He gave an oration to them. And the people cried, The voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he didn't give glory to God. And he died. He was eaten by worms and died. God resists the proud. Now we don't have to wait until an angel strikes us, worms eat us, there are many situations in the Bible where proud people are dealt with. So 
So here what have we been talking about? It is not counted if circumstances humble you. It's not counted if God has to humble you because that's the first part of the words. You're being resisted until you come down on your knees. Although it's a type of humility, but it's not Christ's humility that we're going to that we that we advocate. It is not the character and attribute of humility. The true attribute and character of humility is where out of your own free choice, like Jesus, he didn't have to come down, yet he came down. And when he was under Mary and Joseph, think how difficult it was for him when he knew more than them. He was smarter than them. He might be younger, but he's smarter than them. He knew God more than them. He was closer to God more than them. And yet the Bible says, yeah, he, he submitted to them. That's tough. All his life is humbling himself. Then to John the Baptist, he had no sin. John's baptism was a baptism for remission of sins. And he came to John and says, we need to be baptized. And John himself says, I'm not worried to baptize you. Because not everybody heard that conversation, but he says, I'm not worried to baptize you. And then Jesus says, let's do it for righteousness. Look, righteousness. It was the right thing to do to show his humanity. And then the 40 days, and that we want to focus on tonight. We got a series of humility, so we're not going to touch anything. We're going to focus on this. The 40 days was another period of humbling himself. And then throughout his ministry, although he worked in power, he told his own disciples. He did not come. Even though he's a king, he didn't behave like a king. He says he was like a servant to them. And he proved it on the very night when he was going to be uh, betrayed. <coughs> he stripped off all his clothing, dressed as a servant. Imagine our Lord Jesus cloth only in a loincloth. Taking a towel, going to the disciples' feet and washing them. The disciples are very, very uncomfortable. And Jesus did it to, tell, to show them something. Humility. Nowadays, we don't practice the washing of feet, although in some places people practice that. But you, you know the whole meaning is this. And usually, isn't the last sermon the most important? And why did Jesus choose that? He could have done it any other day. Because he wanted to make such a remarkable and uh, make it a remarkable event. An event that will be seared into their memory. That humility is the true key of Jesus Christ. It's the true key of Jesus Christ. And if we ever want to succeed in any area of our life, if we want the Spirit of God, the angels of God, the might and power of God to work in our lives, humility is the key. But some Christians have been attending church for 30 years, they have never heard a message of humility. But for Jesus, it was the main message. It was His life. How come we miss it? Think about it. Without humility, where can there be submission to God completely? Without humility, how can we abide in Him properly? Without humility, how can we draw near to God and submit to God? Without humility, how can the Spirit of God break us and flow through us? Everything is based on humility. The whole essence of Christianity. We have lost our way. The Christianity that's been presented today is not the 
true pure Christianity that Jesus came to present. We have a form of Christianity that has been embellished by Gentile stars. A form of Christianity where preachers or fivefold ministers become like superstars. We become the top and not the bottom. That's not true Christianity. In the seven thunders and the restoration of the glorious church, the church must rediscover the humility of Christ. How can we reach the level that Jesus reached unless we reach the same level of His humility? Isn't it true that everything Jesus had and received was based on His humility? Read Philippians 2 again. It is based on that. If that is true, then we must rediscover His humility to receive everything He received. That's why it's important for us to learn what the humility of Christ is. And so we introduce this subject by looking at Christ's humility and there are some minor points and simple points that we bring forth first. And let's not start where He is the Trinity coming down, the one we cannot comprehend. But let's start where he grew up as a human. Because on the human level, we can relate to that. And that's the first point of humility. In learning humility, that is. We learn humility by relationship with someone. We learn humility by submitting to someone. Of course, we pray that you'll be a good person to submit to. Because there is a doctrine in the 1970s that came about um, uh, called the Submission Doctrine. And people were demanding submission of people. And uh, although the Bible pictures the church as an army of God, and we learn that the church is an army of God, and we can learn lessons from the army. But at the same time, the church is also spoken of like a field. And uh, Paul talked about the soldier, the farmer, and all these illustrations. And yet there are points that we gain from everything. So there are there are points that we need to take, but the central point is humility. In learning submission, and submission is never demanded and never taken. It is given. True, if someone comes and says, submit to me, there is demanding submission. Submission is given, not taken. And uh, when submission is given, it's, it's when you live your life in such a manner that people say, I want to learn from you. Then they say, then you tell them, to learn, you need to submit and learn. And that's true submission. Where it's free will, free choice, and voluntary. And of course, once you get into the system, then there is the protocol of training and all those things uh, that are there. But the entrance into a, uh, I need to emphasize the entrance into a position of submission to a person is voluntary. And it should never be demanded. And at all times, your free will is intact. You could choose on your free will to walk out. If you enter into any submission relationship with a person where your free will is not have no intact, uh, is not intact, you, you you lost your free will, and when you cannot cannot walk out of it, you're not in Christianity, you're in a cow. Only cows do that. Cows brainwash you. Cows tell you not to think, and they think for you. And uh, cults demand things of your life that are uh, unreasonable. And cults rob you of your free will. So that every decision you want to make, you cannot make. Instead of developing your free will, they're eating and robbing you more and more. That's like submitting to the devil. Submission to the devil, he robs of free will. He likes to possess people. He likes to steal their free will. Dominate them until you're slaves. 
in no way have we been told to submit to a human being like a slave. You submit to another person as unto Christ. And a person should be treating you as Christ would treat you. Free will is completely intact. And there is a submission of a disciple to a master, but not the submission of a slave to a master. Understand the difference. I need to emphasize that so that those who hear this message will not go on the wrong deep end of submission. And, uh, and, and the main thing to check is this. Number one is your free will state in that. You know, are you still free to make decisions? Are you free to think for yourself? Are you free to analyze things for yourself? Are you free to uh, ponder, meditate on things for yourself before you make a decision? Or has your decision away from you? So, that's the first checkpoint. Second checkpoint, can you walk out of that relationship freely? If you cannot walk out, then you're in a cult. You're in bondage to that relationship. And uh, thirdly, is Christ still at the center of that uh, trainer, trainee relationship? If Christ is still at the center, uh, Christ is being glorified. And uh, Christ's teaching and the word, the word of God is still first place. And when those things disappear, then it's a warning sign. Because Christ is no more. If all the cults, cult leaders have replaced Christ, and something else has replaced the Bible. So that's the next checkpoint. And the last checkpoint um, is to note whether your life has grown stronger or weaker. Are you a stronger person or weaker person? In other words, can you function independently? Most people who are in the wrong relationship with Asia cannot function independently anymore. Everything they rely on and they're addicted to the other person and they're not self-reliant anymore. Christ wants to make us self-reliant on Him, of course. <coughs> and so, after removing all those, let's get to the main point that I want to point to in the book of 1 Peter chapter 5. Notice it says in verse 5, it relates to younger submitting to the elder. And uh, we are told, of course, to give respect to all those who are older than us. And uh, at the same time, we realize that sometimes uh, spiritual age is different. Some people who are younger, they are more mature than people who are older and they go younger in spirit. And uh, so, in spite of that, still, there is a, uh, it's not just submission, it's submission. Notice, notice what the submission is. Submit yourself to your elders. Then he says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Notice that fact. And that's why you can add that the fifth fact in your submission relationship. Does the other, is the other person you're submitting to still teachable? Can the other person, can you report back and say, hey, you know, uh, uh, this, this thing in the Bible, you know, I think you're going off track. So, uh, that must always be. The Bible is above all of us. The law of the Bible is above all of us. No one is above the Bible. And even all my teaching is submitted to the Word. If you find anything that is not in line with the Word, please tell me. And uh, we, the Word comes first place. And Jesus must be glorified. And so all of us, no matter how powerful we are, how strong we are, how great authority we carry, and we might be leaders over millions of people. Some of us will be captains of thousands, some ten thousand, some hundreds of thousands, some a million. And we may be leaders over a million people. But yet we must remain teachable. So that submit one to another. And, uh, and it's a difficult relationship, but it is possible. It's just like uh, uh, husbands and wives. You know, if the husband is, let's say, an architect, the husband is an architect in his job. He comes home. He is a father to the children. Uh, he has the authority. He is a husband to the wife. But he is also all one together in the Lord. And uh, 
then as all the family grow, there is a relationship, different different relationship. But then it's not a husband to the wife, it's a friend to the wife. They can share one to another. It's just like uh, the relationship between Christ and the church. And uh, so any true submission has to base on that relationship. Christ is so kind and he cares for the church and the church submits to Christ. That kind of relationship. So they submit one to another. But this is the point that we want to make. Part of humility is learning to relate to submit to another human being. Unfortunately, there are no shortcuts. So those of us who have never submitted to authority before, all your life you're running from authority, or you grew up with with an abusive uh, parent, so you find it hard to submit. If you don't watch out, that, that rebellion begins to carry on in everything else in your life. Until somewhere along the line, you found a good role model to submit to. Then you learn something that you forgot to learn. And people who have no humility is because they have never related to someone they could submit to. So humility comes very difficult for them. And part of learning humility is God will put you in a situation where you have a human being to submit to. And we all learn out of that relationship. And uh, it's not easy, right? But let's look at the life of Jesus and uh, in the Gospel of Luke. He learned humility if, and even though he was uh, much, much more capable than uh, his parents. In chapter 2, chapter 2 of Luke, by the time he was 12 years old, and before that he, was, he, he, he grew and became strong in the spirit. And there's this incident that gives an example here in chapter 2, verse 41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. Joseph and his mother did not know. They supposed that he was with the company, so they went one day's journey. It's a, it's a long way. They travel one whole day. That means that if they come back, they go to travel one more day coming back. And then they looked for him among the relatives and acquaintances. And they could not find him. And finally, they came to Jerusalem looking for him. By the time they found him, it was three days later. Where he ate, where he slept, no one knew. Jesus knows how to take care of himself. So he's independent. Verse 46. So it was that after three days, they found him in the temple. He was sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. They, will, they all hear him. They were astonished at his understanding and answer. Now, he, did, he was listening to them and he was also asking questions. What he was learning? Here you see the submissive Jesus. Hey, this is perfect. God manifests in the flesh. Think how difficult it was to submit. And yet he submitted. And the teachers that he learned from, he, he probably know more than them. He probably can outlearn them. And, and, and one day, he is going to be talking to them and teaching them. But look, he was learning from them. We always learn humility in relating to someone. And, or some, or a lot, or a group of people, whatever. There is always that human level. Jesus did not escape that either. So anyway, uh, they spoke to him in exasperation in verse 48. They said, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and, and I have sought you anxiously. Of course, three days cannot find his son. Then Jesus says, Why do you seek me? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? And he's 12 years old talking. He's talking like he's 30 years old. He knows more than anyone. He's smarter than anyone. He's more spiritual than anyone. His IQ higher than anyone. He's perfect. Uh, 
They did not understand what he was saying. Then he says in verse 51, He went down with them, came to Nazareth, and look at that word, was subject to them. Do you see that word? They were subject to them. Jesus! So the mother might say, Hey, uh, son, go run this errand. And he didn't go run the errand. He learned submission through relating with someone. Unfortunately, all of us do not have that situation. And uh, some of us in our home, we do not have that uh, privilege. And uh, or sometimes the submission demanded of us is from uh, too strong. And then we react against it, especially if your character is strong, you react against it. And uh, that becomes rebellious. And, uh, and you, you need that to survive. But at some point, part of humanity which we'll see in this series is being broken. You know, if you capture a horse, or even if you go to a horse breeder and get a horse from a horse breeder, if a horse has never been ridden before, although the horse, one of the things I admire about a horse, it, it seems to be created just for sitting on. Right? This nice friend just to sit on the back. But no horse will let you sit on that. That's why you've got all these rodeos. Because a horse that has never been tamed, you're not comfortable with someone on their back. Say, hey, I, uh, I, and say, what's the name of your horse? Born free. <laughs> never been set on. Running free. It takes time for them to adjust to having somebody on their back all the time. The first time the horse will cease. And the horse will try to throw the rider out. <laughs> then they'll go on the rodeo. They take the horses that have never had people ridden on. And it will do all it can to throw you off. And so you need an expert to, to break that horse. We call it breaking the horse. And so you go, one horse. Until finally, the horse says, all right, I yield. And then only the horse can be a horse to be trained. A good horse. And horses can do a lot of tricks. And uh, they can march in time and trot in different styles. And then you start being able to train. So in the same way, all of us are born with sin nature. The first thing about sin nature is it cannot submit. Cannot yield. Will not yield. We are all like wild horses. We need to be broken. Not our spirit broken, but the will must be broken. Our will must be broken. Then only humility can come. And remember this, if our will is not going to be broken, some people end up in prison before their wills get broken. Some, their whole life, their will not be broken, they end up in prison, life sentence or death sentence. And they die, they will end up with the devil and then see how the devil dominates. You cannot escape, whether in this life or in the next life you'll be dominated. That's why the Bible tells us to be slaves of righteousness rather than slaves of sin. And again we see, humility must be learned in a relationship. So you have Jesus approaching John, John the Baptist. And let's look at the Gospel of John chapter 1. John knew who Jesus was. And he even acknowledged that when Jesus comes, he says he's not even worthy in John chapter 1 to lose his sandal strap, to, to tie or untie his shoe string, figuratively speaking. And so he spoke of that in John chapter 1, verse 27. 
Let's look at the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus goes to the waters of baptism in Matthew chapter 3. And remember, he already met John, or John has sourced, has seen him and proclaimed he's the Son of God. And finally, it's time. In John chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus came from Galilee to John and the Jordan to be baptized by him. Now, this Jesus knew is the, is, is the beginning of his ministry. And he has come to John. And John tried to prevent him. Look, John says, no. John knew who he was. Saying, I need to be baptized by you. You coming to me. And John actually, at first, reluctant. But look at the submission of Jesus. Jesus says, you know, he wants to heal. Although this one is about baptism, since it's Chinese New Year, a lot of Ang Pao's coming to many people. But traditionally, those who are married, sorry, you don't give her the Ang Pao. <coughs> but people still give Ang Pao. Isn't that? And, uh, so, sometimes when you give Ang Pao to one another, of course, Chinese New Year, they give oranges and Ang Pao's and all that. But have you seen it where sometimes people give things and say, you know, Oh, here's a present for you. Is it my love, my love? <laughs> you know, which uh, translated for those who don't understand that mm. on the internet, we miss. I don't want, I don't want. You know, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do they say when they want to give? Yeah, um, yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Sometimes you say, Myla, Myla, but in the heart, I'm Myla, but don't So, uh, it's, uh, it's just uh, that thing, you know. So you can imagine, here is Jesus, want to be baptized, and John the Baptist said, Myla, be Myla, Myla. Jesus said, Oh, it's Myla, Myla. <laughs> so, and, uh, if Jesus was speaking in Hokkien or whatever that was, I know, uh, okay, teach you. And uh, so Jesus sort of insisted and uh, hey, he insists to be humble. Have you ever had someone say, I insist I want to serve you? Instead, most people say, I insist to be served. But here is Jesus wanting to be humble. And John knew he was higher. But he wants to be lower. The very act of being baptized by John, although John did not, in a sense, baptizing, you know, uh, uh, literally, uh, uh, more figuratively, but Jesus sort of put himself in. John would have probably touch it. Uh, no. But the very fact is, he wants to come under John. Have, have anyone has such humility? Say, I want to submit to him. I want to submit. And he said, man, beside me, like young man. Jesus was insisting that he wants. Because this is the secret that Jesus, that we must learn. And, and that we must learn to submit one to another. And uh, so this Jesus, in the end, John says, <sighs> if John was Singaporean, Okay, la. <laughs> and if Jesus was Singaporean, thank you, la. And if God the Father was Singaporean, this is my son, la. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. And who might well please? But Jesus says in verse 15, permit it to be so for now. It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus said, this is for righteousness. It fulfill the law of God. You are the ministry before me, I must yield to you. So that there is continuity. And <clears throat> Again, notice, it came through human religion. And God the Father was very pleased. Not only with that occasion, 
but with everything Jesus has done. So God the Father now. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, la. We know the law. And God is well pleased. Submission is always in a relationship situation. And we need to learn to do that. And of course the other part where Jesus showed great humility was with his disciples. The one we keep. But tonight we're going to look at uh, uh, another key in another key in humility and learning here. One is it's always in relationship to other humans. Unfortunately, discipleship in this life there will always be someone younger than you, someone older than you. Someone smarter than you, someone you're smarter than. This always go will put all kinds of situation in your life. And there will always be a relationship of submission somewhere along the line. But the second important thing that we're learning from Jesus is this. Everything that Jesus received, he never takes himself. He just chose to humble himself and he waited till the Father give it to him. In this life, we learn the opposite rule from Charles Darwin, survival of the fittest. If you don't fight to survive, you just die. And the weakest die off, only the strongest survive. And then they evolve. The spiritual law is different. So many times we want things in life. Uh, you want to better yourself. Oh, you grab it. Whether you pull someone down, step on their head, and you want things, you grab here, grab this, grab this. And yes, there is a law about faith and taking risks. That is separate. But do you know, behind everything there must be humility. Even faith has humility. If we don't learn this humility, we will be going to places because of our pride, doing things because of our pride. And we have to experience failure before we learn to take it only when God gave. Don't take it, God never gave. And that's Jesus. Everything was always Jesus yielding. Then God gave. Yielding. When He died on the cross, he yielded. He gave, yielded to God. Everything was yielding. He never takes something himself. And he's always waiting for God to give it to him. That's how much. Remember the second verse, second, second part of the verse said, if you humble yourself, God exalts him. And he said that in the book of, uh, uh, in his first, in his Sermon on the Mount. When he called the beatitude, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You don't grab the earth, you don't conquer the earth, you inherit the earth. You're given. The meek inherit the earth, not the strong. And sometimes you find the strong fight, 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 and then both die. Then the other guy was breathing around this, everything fell the person. And there is a verse in the book of Ecclesiastes that the race is not to the strong nor to the swift. But chance happens to all of them. But behind it, in the Hebrew word, is God working. And what how does God work? He gives it to the meek and to the humble. It's good to humble ourselves. And in our first point, humility is in relationship to someone. And humility is also part of point one is this other part. When people humble and humiliate you, if God permits that, vengeance belongs to the Lord. 
and the just shall live by faith. These two verses tells you you don't react. Vengeance belongs to the Lord means you cannot take vengeance. The judge shall live by faith, saying, you wait and you trust for God to avenge you. You will just exercise faith that God will deliver you. In both counts, it's not you who avenge yourself. And because of that, Jesus tells us that sometimes in certain situations, like in Luke chapter 6, Whenever you're being humbled by people, in Luke chapter 6, like for example, when persecution comes, in verse uh, <coughs> uh, 23, he says, uh, verse 22, 23. Why did he say in verse 22, Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, they revile you, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake? How can that be a blessing? How many people see that when you're being humiliated, when you're being run down, how can we say that as a blessing? This is where it is a blessing. You're being humble. After humbling, what is that? Exaltation. Now let's say, say that together. After humbling, comes exaltation. Let's say that again. After humbling, comes exaltation. So whenever there is a humbling, and especially if you're walking right with God, remember the other one is God resisting you, not counter. But when you're walking right with God, and you're being humiliated and humble, that is a blessing. Now you can see why it's a blessing. Because there's a payday someday coming for you. There's an exhortation coming. And the lower you've been humble, the higher you will go. And that's the law of humility. The humbling comes to humans. Of course, humans are inspired by the devil. At which other point are we humans going to experience being humble? You don't want to experience it from God. Only the bad guys experience it from God. And God advises, don't let us experience humbling from Him because He's humbling us finish. So tell me, when you're going to experience it? You talk, wow, learning humility, I just pray, humble myself, kneel, that's it. Yeah, you humble yourself, kneel, and everything looks so nice in church. Then you go out, somebody scold you, you scold them back. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> what kind of humbling is that? You forgot the most basic lesson about hum humility. You learn humility when people are running you down. Imagine how many of you just miss your rewards. That's the first thing Christians react to, isn't it? When they're being run down. Now, if we are being run down justly, there's nothing to say. But when you're doing all that you know you do, and everything is coming, you say, ah! God, where are you? God said, it's because I'm here, that's why this is happening. Say, God, why is all this thing? God said, God may say, before exhortation is humbling. That means He has intention to exhort you. Now, all of you, you have wonderful prophecies coming to you. I'm sure all positive prophecies, you know, <laughs> but the prophets look like, oh, okay. <laughs> But anyway, we are in, we're going to uh, have the microphone. Those of you online, you know, we'll make sure you have that. I think there are about six of them, right? More than that. More than that, huh? Okay, you got the list, huh? Okay. So, there are a lot online expecting that tonight. But remember, to, this teaching is very important to prepare you. Because before 
And all the prophets need to talk about God exalting you. He say, hey, did God use the word exalt? He don't have to. If He tells you that He's going to make you very rich, isn't that your exaltation? Now, if He says He's going to bless you and make you very rich, how do you think the path to riches will be? All the while you're thinking, oh, a rocket. Excuse me. Your Bible says, this way first, then up there. Before exaltation is humility. Now, if God says, and you got a call from God, He's going to annoy you powerfully. Excuse me, that is also exaltation. He's going to exalt you like the way he exalted Joshua. He says he's going to make his name great. Guess what? Before exaltation is? Very soft. Too soft. Before exaltation is? Yes, thank you. How come we never got the message? So every time, before the exaltation, must come the humbling. Now, how is the humbling going to come? You thought the humbling just come, you know, from your own heart, new more. Fast more, yes, thank you. <laughs> this one other thing. But part of it is, He's going to let human beings wall out you. If there's such a word. Really humble you. And you might have to taste some humiliating experience. Cross bearing experiences when you bear the cross. And now you know why a lot of prayers are not answered. Because you got your, your, your prophecy or your word from God. God going to make you very rich. God going to make you very powerful. God going to make you very anointed. God going to make all this thing. And then he said, Wow, yeah, God, looking forward to it. And then the first thing that happened, all these things that keep humbling you, you know, say, you have been resisting that for the last 30 years. God has been waiting 30 years to bless you. And you've been resisting that. No wonder. You never got. And there you are. Every time you pray, you say, God, why you never answer my prayer? God looks around at the angel and says, Is the person dead or what? <laughs> and why? He never, my word and telling him, I've been trying to bless him and he's been resisting for 30 years. God was answering. He has to teach you humility first before he exalts you. For Jesus, it was the same. And not that you purposely go and ask for persecution. <laughs> and after this, you know, you go to someone like, Hey, please, persecute me more. <laughs> we never ask you to look for that. You just have to live right, it will surely come. But the fact is, it will come. God has His ways to, to make you humble, to teach you humility. And then He says, this is a blessing. And He says in verse 23, Rejoice in that day and live for joy. For your, indeed, your reward is great in heaven. He says, in that manner, their fathers did to the prophets. Every man and woman of God has suffered humiliation. Now, David, I can show you, and in this series, I show you every single time. There's always this. Before exaltation, there is humility. You know, David was humble many, many years, running through the wilderness. But look at how great he became. There's always that part before God exhausts a person highly. And in fact, in the, from the spiritual world, uh, there is like three layers of uh, things. There is in, there's a, like a barrier in the physical world. When you go to the spiritual world, this physical world is like in a certain container, uh, something that you pass through some dimension. And um, 
when you are outside in a certain spiritual dimension looking at people on earth sometimes you see people on earth wow they look more shiny and they got lights all over them then when you cross over through the barrier and you look eh, the lights that were on them were actually things that people say about them that were wrong accusation persecutions in words and action all kinds of things people doing to them but from the other world it looks shiny from this world it looks very black you know something look, doesn't look nice first Peter chapter 5 tells us when you are persecuted for Christ the spirit of glory rests on you it is something shiny one day we will discover this this principle that Jesus taught in Luke chapter 6 is on the other side we will have that so learn the first point all humbling on this earth will come to humans if you want to wait for it to come to God it's too late that's when you're proud that's it deal with you and that one you know they will, that nothing that can help you that's why the Bible and verses they humble ourselves now but the fact is God uses humans your relationship with human or he uses humans who are sometimes uh, inspired by the devil or influenced by the devil and God permits that for a short time so that you learn your humility once you learn your lesson you're immune to it you're immune to all these things time for exaltation and it comes from places and people you never never expect but God is good in learning how to permit things the second thing is learning from Jesus as I said do not take anything for yourself wait until God exhausts you God gives it to you in a way of God exalting is God gives it to you like Jesus and his when he's and Jesus when he fasted 40 days in uh, we see him fast uh, 40 days let's take any one of the Gospels uh, let's take the one from Mark Mark chapter 1 here we are at the end of 40 days Fasting is a type of humbling ourselves before God. And uh, David talked about humbling himself by fasting. And so in Mark chapter 1, it tells us here, about well, our Lord Jesus, <clears throat> in chapter 1, was uh, 12 and 13 after the baptism, immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him in verse 11 the voice came from heaven saying you are my beloved son in whom I well pleased and the Spirit like a dove came upon him Jesus already was sinless Jesus was righteous Jesus was full of God Jesus was anointed Jesus had the Holy Spirit Jesus had the angels with him then why did Jesus fast? see most people they, they fast for something what did Jesus need? from God he doesn't need anything correct? He was anointed. He had waited on God for 30 years. At the age of about 30, he went to be baptized and he, he is a Messiah. John announced that. Why did Jesus fast? Jesus did not need anything at all. Talk about power. He got the power. He got the Holy Spirit. Talk about authority. He had authority. Talk about perfection, he was perfect. Talk about relationship with the Father, very deep. He was deeper than any one of us. He did not need to fast for power. He did not need to fast for any needs. He got all his needs met. There were angels all around, ministering to him all the time, just waiting to serve him. 
Jesus doesn't need anything. What do you need of us? I used to talk the other reason, which is still true. Every time the enemy attacks, you fast. And he has been told to us, when the disciples could not cast out one of the demons, Jesus says, this can come up for not Papa fasting and prayer. So fasting is an important thing. We are told also in the Old Testament, a panorama given to Pastor David, uh, that uh, the archangel declared that fasting and prayer are the, is the key to all things spiritual and natural. So it's an important key. Why did Jesus need to fast? He had authority of the devil too. He also the power of the flesh. Let me tell you the one reason why Jesus need to fast. You already have been saying that. Before exhortation is... Because uh, Jesus has to follow the law of God and humble himself. Later on, men will humiliate him as his missing group. But before people know about him, before exhortation, there is humility, humbly. Jesus knows that law. So for 40 days, he humbled himself. Since there are no human beings, the devil throw everything at him. And everything was testing him in the flesh. And Jesus chose to be not yielding to it. Jesus followed the law. 40 days he was fasting. In a sense, those of you have completed the 40 days. Although we have encouraged you to write down certain things to concentrate on praying, because we are not quite exactly like Jesus, nor we are as perfect as him. You do have things in your life you want to pray through. But above all those things, it is this 40 days of just humbling yourself before. Because before exaltation is humility. humility. And I will challenge each one of you. If every year you humble yourself, that's why our fast is at the beginning of the year, not at the end of the year. Not even in the middle, although we have different type of fast in the throughout. Because we want to start the year with humility. And every year you humble yourself. It is the law of God. You want to receive from God, not receive from the hand of man. God does use men. God does use organization. But in the end, it is God inspiring you. Before we receive anything, we must humble ourselves. That's why fasting comes in. And it's a price to fast. Not easy to fast. It's, a, it's something that we choose. But here we look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. In Luke, chapter 4. And this is a we only got two points, and the first point is all humbling comes with human beings. A relationship to them or to humans that God permit to cause us to walk the road of humility and bear the cross. But the other point is all things are received based on humility. Everything, all Everything classified under exaltation. Everything is received based on humbling ourselves. It's nothing so that God can give it to us. Total dependence on God. So in chapter 4, it says in verse 1, Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. Afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And then the devil came 
Because the devil knew he was hungry. The devil said, remember, his 40 official days are finished. But this is so ingrained into Jesus. <coughs> he will not take something. Nor make something for himself. If he is to receive anything, it will be God the Father moving to give it to him. Even up to the day that he was to be crucified, it was the Holy Spirit inspiring a woman who buy the alabaster flask of perfume and anoint him. Jesus never go and buy himself. Jesus always received from the hand of the Father. Says here. He was hungry. And then the devil said, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Jesus refused. Is it mentioned not only by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? He refused to turn the stone into bread for himself. He got the angels. In fact, the Bible tells tell us that after the devil is, uh, after 40 days, you know, and the devil is left, the angels ministered to him. The angels are ready to minister to him. The angels were as command. But Jesus wants to receive things through humanity. He has to set a pattern for us. All things in this life are received based on humility. That's why the road of humility is a very important road. And the next time when you're being humbled by whatever situation, take it gladly. Say yes. Humility will lead to exaltation. And the next time you got promise of exaltation, be ready to take the road of the cross. Humility. Didn't Jesus say it to all his disciples? Take up the cross. What does the cross represent? Most people say suffering. More than suffering. The cross is humiliation. Do you know how humiliated Jesus was? Arrested, dragged through town, crucified, stripped of everything, crucified. Jesus was humiliated. The cross, and he just absorbs it. Can you absorb that? Can you allow? Like a war horse, the wheel to be broken. So that now Jesus can ride on you. God can come upon your life and take you where He wants you to be. Before exaltation is humiliation. Is humility. After being humble, you will always be exalted. And receive from the hand of God, whatever God wants. That is why everything is called a gift. You receive the gift of righteousness, you receive the gift of uh, uh, salvation, you receive the gift of eternal life, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you receive the gifts of the Spirit, and even the five ministries are called gifts from Jesus. Because we are to rely on what comes from God, not what we take with our own hands. I didn't say that you do nothing. Whenever God gives, then you work with God. When Paul worked his apostleship, it was the gift, the grace, and he learned to work with the gift. The whole of Christian life is based on gifts. Nothing of our self. The whole of Christian life is not based on wages. That God pay us for our works. It is saying, God, hear my let your gift so. And I can tell you, when it's time, it's time. When it's time for your exhortation, it's time. Okay, let's look at Joshua. God says to him, 
I will make your name great. But who was Joshua? Servant to Moses. Who was he when Moses was alive? Nothing. He was just known as a servant. Now, he was sometimes asked to go out to battle by his servants. He was known as Moses' servant. That's the word minister in the Hebrew translation. He did learn humility. And when it was time for him, nothing could stop him. He became the allegory and the typology of Jesus, taking the people to the promised land. He was so great and so powerful, he stopped the sun. He did mighty warfare. His name was fear. Who was Moses? Moses had his life divided in the 40, 40, 40. The first 40 years, he learned to do things and get things by thinking. The first 40 years he learned. For him, the first 40 years is blessed is a man who is strong, for she, they shall possess the earth. The Bible tells us that he was mighty in word and deeds. The book of Josephus that writes the story of the Jews says that Moses was successful as a warrior. He's a mighty prince. Very skilled. He learned that he was a great man himself. When he visited the, his own people and he killed the Egyptian, the book of Acts chapter 7 tells us, he supposed that they will know by his hand they will be delivered. He knew he was chosen. But he failed to learn the most important lesson. Everything is worked by humility first. So Moses had to unlearn everything he learned. In Acts 7, he said he was mighty in words and deeds. At the end of 40 years in the wilderness, he said, I cannot speak properly. Hey, I thought he was mighty in words. He said, oh, I, I'm not eloquent. He really unlearned everything. He learned that all his power was nothing. He learned you cannot receive things by taking and grabbing. Some of you might say, hey, but the people doing that, they don't last long. Did Hitler last long? No. Did Saddam Hussein last long? No. Did some of the evil people say to last long? No, they were not. The Bible prophesied even the wicked, when they have riches, they will die without enjoying that and their riches will end up in the hands of the righteous. The Bible in the world sometimes tells us, don't go and envy the wicked who are, who seem to have many things, because in the end they will come to their doom. Because God will resist the problem. This is the law of God. On one hand, we learn humility. On the other hand, we learn to receive it as a gift. Whatever we have. Nothing more as a gift from God. That if God prophesy afterwards something that you're going to have, please wait patiently with God. Because everything has its timing. It might take time to take place. Paul, the day he was born again in Acts chapter 9, Ananias received a word from the Lord from him that he will testify before Gentiles, Jews, and kings. Do you know the last part, testify before kings, only took place when he was humbled as a prisoner. In chains, testify. Say with humility and exhortation. He never rushed it. He never said, oh, I'm going to talk to King. And he straight away look at those things. It has to be received 
and not created by yourself. If it is to be received, then it must wait till God give it. Then we enter God opens the door. Even Paul says he prays for open door. If God never opened the door, wait. If God keep the door closed, wait. Because God knows your heart, whether you can handle it, whether you have pride, whether you have things in your life still, God knows. We don't God. One thing we know, I'm sure of, because I've realized I've been meditating and confessing that since 8 November 1979. One billion souls. Before I finish my ministry, we have one billion people touched by the ministry. Why am I in a hurry? No. When it comes, it comes. Do I believe that it will surely be 1,000%? Will we have mega churches all over the world? Yes, bigger than any the world has ever seen. But I'm, not, I'm not impatient. I'm not running around in a hurry. Because when it comes, it comes. When it's not your timing, it's just not your timing. You don't rush things. Everything has its perfect time. And you say, wow, it's going to take a long time. It doesn't. Within three years, Jesus touched the entire Israel. Plus, surrounding regions. All he took him was three years. And he said, the works that I do, you will do greater works. We just have to receive it as a gift of God. That includes ministry and your life. Whether your life is as a doctor, architect, engineer, a businessman, or whatever professional, change your thinking. You will be what you will be as a gift, not as a work. And to, for it to be a gift, learn humility, and when you learn a lesson, when it comes to your time, it is yours. God will keep every promise and will not delay. Your life has a destiny whatever your life is tonight. And it's good that those of you have gone through your 40 days fast. And we went through 40 days not because we want to twist God's arm. You know, that's not possible. In the first place, you try to twist God's arm, your own arm gets twisted worse. God is so much stronger than you. And your 40 days fast and my 40 days fast is not works. We don't believe that. It is just our way of saying, Father, we humble ourselves. Whatever you have for us, let it be so. But we understand the key that to all things. That is why prayer and fasting is so powerful. Because prayer is dependence on God, fasting is super dependence on God. And putting yourself in a position where you're dependent on God. Look at every time the people have fasted in the Bible. They are surrounded by armies greater than them. But when they fast and pray, they won. Always. Because the path is through humility. Prayer is good. Tonight, your first time, or your new moment prayer. Pray true because it's humbling yourself before God. In the end, God will exalt you. But after God exalts you, you become proud of finished. God also will resist you. And I've seen that in so many lives. People learning different lessons and then they really uh, learn to seek God, humble themselves, go on their knees before God. And God's mercies are great. And he will bring people through the most difficult times. And uh, when you are a businessman who is very well known, 
and uh, he lost everything. He's a multi-millionaire. Lost everything. In those days when we were pastoring in Malaysia. And in prison in Singapore. And he went back to Malaysia, prison again. It's so really humiliated. By the time we came to be acquainted with him, to some of our business leaders in our church, we went to his house and visit, sometimes pray there. His wife told me this, many nights, many nights he would just sleep next to the bed, kneeling down, crying. Because he was a complete bankrupt. He not just an ordinary makeup, he owned hundreds of millions of dollars. And these are the words of the wife. Many nights, he would just kneel down and spend all night crying to God. Asking God to forgive all the wrongs he's done. Humbling. And again, Before exaltation, it took him many years. But all it took is a special thing that God did with one of his investments overseas, in Europe, and in where one. He been paid all his debt. Came out of bankruptcy. Became multi-millionaire again. And now he is based in China. And well recognized in China. Now he ever becomes proud, finish. But he hold on to humility. Continue to be a blessing. There is always a payday someday. But the road is not a broad road that leads to destruction. It's a narrow road that goes to the cross. And many people reach the cross, they cannot go through. They try everywhere. Because to go through the cross, you need to be humble. Allow themselves to go through the cross, then they see the exaltation after that. This is the most important lesson in life. Because if you are the most humble person on earth, and if you humble yourself greatly, your exaltation will be also as great. So as you have Humble yourself before God for 40 days. Prepare yourself to receive God's blessing tonight. When the prophet prophesies, ministers, why will words God give you? And remember, after why will words God give you? Keep walking the path of humility. Because greatness with God is a path of humility. Permanently. So that one day, even when you're the richest person on earth, you're the most famous person on earth, the most powerful person on earth, and yet you can be as humble as Jesus, the world will be a different world. And we can change this world for Jesus one last time before the end times the new world takes over. Praise God. We're going to go to God in prayer. Then after that, I'll give you a prayer. Let's pray. Father, teach us this lesson from Jesus. Humility and the road of the cross is such a hard lesson. And sometimes we find pride in ourselves in areas that we never thought existed. We ask, so, Father God, will you teach us humility? 
and you teach us the road that Jesus walked. And we knew he walked the path of humility, not as an atonement. The atonement was on the cross. But he walked a path of humility to show us the way. Where he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So, Father, we ask that we learn the road of humility. We learn that all self must die. We learn that pride must be resisted and crushed. We learn, Father God, that the proud and the strong do not possess the earth. They all die. Only the meek will inherit the earth. And this earth has been given as a gift. You give fame as a gift. You give the power of wealth as a gift. You give us to be numerous in numbers as a gift. For it's a curse to be few in numbers. But it's a blessing to be numerous like Abraham's children. And it will be so. All things are a gift from you. So Father, we just want to function in your gifting. To be all that you want us to be. We ask, O oh Father, that you teach us humility. And tonight, whatever word we receive from you, we approach the prophecy with a humble heart. We do not come with pride. If we, anyone here has pride, Father, deal with it. Deal with it, Father. Convict our hearts that as we approach that to receive the words of prophecy, we yield ourselves. We yield ourselves to you. We again acknowledge we are nothing. It's only what you build into our life, what you gifted into our life, that we can become who we are. We thank you, Father, as we walk this road of humanity. Thank you, Father. Seal this word in our heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. We sing one song. Let's all rise together before we take the word. I have decided to follow Jesus.
Amen. Give you the good kind of offering.